Naku no Naku Koroni. Oh, yeah, let's turn down that sound. Hopefully, we can finish this and we can do the finale climax. Let's go. Dad! Mom! Who would do something like this? <laughs> Jessica's ro full voice echoed throughout the rose garden. Perhaps it was the intuition of a person who lived on this island. After checking the part of the rose garden where Aunt Rosa and Maria had fallen and seen nothing, Jessica went to look in the arbor next. Normally the arbor was probably a wonderful location to enjoy tea peacefully while appreciating the roses on a good sunny day. Maybe even Uncle Kraus and Aunt Natsuhi had days when they relaxed and enjoyed their tea together here. In that arbor lay their corpses. At least they aren't drenched in the rain like Aunt Rosa and Maria had been. But there's no way I could say that out loud to Jessica at the moment. What do you think, Dr. Nanjo? Strangulation, I believe. Come, take a look at this. On the necks, there are distinct markings that something thin was used to strangle them. Right. I doubt those things were the primary cause for their deaths. Right there lay the two stake-like weapons decorated with an occult design, which had found driven into Uncle Krause's thigh area and near Aunt Natsuhi's calf. When we found these sticking out of my parents' foreheads' chests, we decided to preserve the crime scene and leave them for the police, but Jessica didn't care about such matters and immediately pulled the stakes out of her parents' forbidden bodies, forsaken bodies. By now the bodies gouged in the chest, head, stomach, knee, and leg have been found. Ah! Damn it! Damn it! I'll kill him! Murder! Kill him! Ah! With this, the eighth toilet has been completed. Is this going to continue on to the ninth twilight? The witch shall be revived and none shall be left alive. Bring it on! If the witch revives, that means the culprit's gonna take this grand appearance. I messed up, I'm sorry. Bring it on! If the witch revives, that means the culprit is gonna make his grand appearance, right? No one's going to be left alive! Bullshit! I'll kill him! I'll definitely kill the culprit who killed Dad Mom with my own hands! Jessica let her emotions flow out as she howled furiously. To avoid being crushed by grief, she could do nothing but resist it with anger. We still haven't found George. Jessica, you children had better stay here. I'll go to the mansion. A Ava, we mustn't split up. It's dangerous if we do not all stick together. There's nothing we can do for Nissan and his wife. But George may still be alive somewhere. I have no time to waste here. As Aunt Eva screamed this, Jessica glared at her. Ava had no more time to bother about the dead. She was more concerned about the safety of her only son, who had yet to be seen. Jessica, you should stay by your father and mother's side. I'll make a short trip to the mansion. Balor and Dr. Nanjo, you two can stay here as well. After arbitrarily saying this, Aunt Ava rushed out of the arbor. I called out to her, but there was no way she'd listen. Half her being alone in the situation meant nothing short of death. If we silently watched her leave, it would be the same as letting her die. Since Aunt Ava was unwilling to stop, we had no choice but to follow her. And while it may be cruel to say so, Uncle Kraus and Uncle Natsuhi were already dead. There was nothing more we could do for them. In the end, we had no choice but to console Jessica and head for the mansion together. Fortunately, Jessica stood up. Perhaps she'd been able to break free from her grief. But what had surfaced in this place was an expression like a demon's. I'll kill that person with my own hands. I'll definitely avenge them. Let's go, battler. If we find that culprit, don't get in my way. I'm definitely going to kill them. I've got my own parents to avenge. Sorry, but this is a first come, first serve. Yeah, that's right. Let's kill them. At my words, Jessica finally seemed to feel like we sympathized with her emotions. She still had that dark expression, but I felt that Jessica had regained some of her sanity. We took off, chasing after Aunt Ava through the rose garden, up to the stone steps, running at full speed toward the mansion. Wolf's large, intimidating shout flashed in the lightning. With this, the murders of the epitaph have reached the eighth twilight. And then on the ninth twilight, the witch shall revive. None shall be left alive. 
I will most likely lose my life. But at the very least, I want to burn the truth into my eyes. That's the only thing motivating me to move right now. We were able to meet up with Aunt Ava, who was having trouble with the lock to the front door. It seemed all the blood had risen to Aunt Ava's head. That was probably making her fingers clumsy. It looked like she couldn't even handle the simple task of inserting the key into the lock. Then there was a faint sound. The sound of the door unlocking, just as though I had waited for all the survivors to unite before arriving. It felt to me as though the malicious mansion was trying to swallow up all the remaining humans at once. Perhaps the stench that erupted outwards the instant the door opened couldn't be described as just a smell. It wasn't just a charred smell from Grandfather. I think it may have also contained the regrets of the servants in Dad's group. All the dead. What did it mean as it floated out overwhelming us? Was it the cry of the dead telling us not to enter? However, Aunt Ava didn't even flinch at something like that. And we who had to chase after her were forced to step into the mansion even after receiving that message. George! George! If you can hear me, answer! George! Aunt Ava shouted at the top of her lungs. Considering the situation, it's probably far too optimistic to imagine he's alive. We started to follow Aunt Ava's example, calling out George's names in loud voices. Aunt Ava spotted something and stopped walking. She was standing in front of the door to the parlor. What is this? D Dr. Nanjo, could you come here for a second? What is it? I heard about the eerie magic circles written on the doors, like the one in the parlor from the adults. Eerie is the only word to describe that thing, which was described with a deep red paint reminiscent of blood, so it slowly dripped down. That supposedly had been there since this morning, wondering why Aunt Ava, who had supposedly seen it already, would think it odd now. Jessica and I stared at the door. Certainly, I have no memory of numbers such as these being written here. Right, they weren't. Eerie magical characters were written here, but not numbers. From what the two of them said, only the magic circle had been here this morning. However, right now, there were only eight digits written near the upper part of the magic circle. Zero seven one five one one two nine. I didn't know what that meant, but I didn't want to even imagine what someone had been thinking when they had wrote it. It was drawn with the same paint as the magic circle. It had clearly been written very recently. The way it had dried and the condition of the color was completely different from the magic circle part. <laughs> I'm sure it's just some magical meaning. No point wasting time thinking about it. Jessica intentionally spat those words out in an attempt to push aside the eerie feeling it gave off. It could be a magic square. The idea that the ward against magic can reside in a certain sort of number play. I believe everyone has heard of the one where adding all the numbers in a row, each leads to the same sum. Wasn't that a group of numbers buried in a rectangle? This is just a single row. I don't have a clue what it could mean. What Jessica said is probably correct. There isn't any point in us wasting time thinking about it. Even though she said that, she probably suspected it had to mean something. Aunt Ava was definitely writing that number down on an old receipt or something with a short ballpoint pen. Unless it had some obvious pattern, it'd probably be tough enough to memorize a coat made up of an eight-digit number. Could this be a date? Or something? A date? What are you talking about? Well, it's probably a coincidence, but my birthday is July 15th. Once I thought that 0715 might refer to July. I figured that 1129 stood for November 29. Maybe that fit perfectly. Why would your birthday be written in a place like this? And what's up with the num November 29? That's what I want to know. Still, it's probably just a coincidence. When I thought about it, it started to feel a little creepy. What if someone's birthday was November 29? That's not a birthday of anyone else in my family. Not Dad or Kiri or Angie. And of course, it isn't my mom's either. Nothing comes to mind. I don't believe it's Kinzo's or Genji's birthday. It isn't from my family either, and it isn't Rosa or Maria's. It can't be anyone in my family, and it isn't Canon's or Shannon's. 
I always give the servants presents on their birthdays, so I know it for all of them. But I don't know anyone who was born on November 29th. Once we started imagining the eight digits were meaningless, but actually two dates written together, it really started to look that way. However, its true meaning may be something completely different or there's no meaning at all. Anyway, we don't have any real clues. It's probably pointless to stand around here worrying about it. The inside of the parlor is much more important. This morning, the beginning of the doors with a magic circle drawn on them had been the body of a victim. If something new was added to the store, does that mean something new has been added inside the parlor? When Aunt Ava tried to open it, she felt the resistance of the lock. She immediately took out a master key and put it in a keyhole. As she opened the door, Aunt Ava let out a high-pitched scream and ran inside. That alone was enough to tell us what happened inside the room. Dr. Ananjo and I looked at each other. I shook my head slightly as we entered the parlor. George! George! Hang in there, George! Dr. Nanjo, quickly! George lay there crumpled alongside Shannon's corpse. His chest was stained bright red. Judging by his still opened eyes, I hate to say it to Aunt Ava, but I couldn't pick up any signs of life. After moving to take George's pulse, Dr. Nanjo shook his head, worthlessly reporting that George was dead. Brushing him aside, Aunt Ava once again crouched beside George and started crying at the top of her lungs. With Aniki's death, one thing is certain, the murder's hand ended on the eighth twilight. The epitaph was being carried out into complete form, including the ninth twilight, and none shall be left alive. I was really starting to lose track of things. For some reason, Aunt Ava's half-crazed cries actually made me cool down. Crestfallen and exhausted, I flopped onto the sofa and plunked my feet on top of the table. Maybe all these murders numbed my heart. Instead of just being frightened, I felt completely confused. Dad and Kyrie are dead. People have been killed off one by one, starting with the servants. There's been a hell of a lot of them by now. I don't know when the first murder happened. They might have been killed at a rate about one person per hour by now. We believe the boat will come for us around 9 a.m. tomorrow. There's still a full 12 hours until then. How many more sacrifices to the witch will there have to be for us to survive? With the four of us, if one goes each hour, we won't last any longer than four hours. We don't even know if we'll last until midnight tonight. Yesterday, after lunch, we came into this parlor. Just as they started talking about serving some tea Aunt Rosa had bought, we kids decided to take a walk. Maria was jumping around, wasn't she? Didn't Shannon bring us some cookies? She said Kumasa had baked them or something. It would have been hilarious if she had baked some mackerel into them, wouldn't it? That's right. I'll never hear Kumasawa's mackerel jokes again, will I? All right. If I only remember stuff about Kumasawa, that wouldn't be fair to everyone else. Why did Dad and Kyrie even go outside? It's not like going without food for a day would kill us. So why did Gluttony get a hold of them and make them go out for food? I bet that fearless dad of mine just started complaining about being hungry. Kyrie, you were supposed to be the brakes for my reckless dad. Why didn't you stop him? And what about your daughter, Angie? She's still just six years old. Tell me you plan to leave her in my care. After all, it's doubtful now whether I'll even be able to leave this island alive. S stop! Why are you fighting at a time like this? Jessica, stop! Oh, I'm sorry. This is Nanja's voice. S stop! Why are you fighting at a time like this? Jessica, stop! It's been kind of noisy for a while. By the time I looked up to see what it was, Jessica and Aunt Ava suddenly started fighting each other. You know, maybe I should say that Jessica was grabbing at Aunt Ava. Aunt Ava killed Dad and the rest! There's no other explanation! 
How foolish! Why should I know anything about what happened to your parents? Who was on the first floor of the guest house? Aunt Ava! Dad and Mom were on the first floor lobby along with her! And who was left alive? Only Aunt Ava! Why? It's obvious because you're the culprit! You killed Mom and Dad and carried them outside and then shamelessly locked the door! Trying to make it seem like it was the witch's doing! Then why do you think George disappeared? He never came down to the first floor, so he disappeared from the second floor? And who was on the second floor? You people were, right? You knew, didn't you? You knew that George slipped out of the guest house, and you brazenly acted as if you didn't know anything. If you stopped George, he'd be... He'd be... I said stop. Jessica was in the cousin's room the whole time, and Ava was in the first floor lobby the whole time. Neither of you was responsible for anything. What we have here is simply the sadness of losing family members. The culprit is no one, nowhere. It's all just the witch's fault. So stop hitting each other, you two. The witch's fault, huh? I wonder if that's a good way to cool the situation right now. Yeah, I finally understand why three people evaporated from the guest house. And all the doors and windows were locked from the inside. This is what they were after. Making us think the culprit was inside. And sparking this ugly mutual hatred. It has to be the culprits. The witch's goal. But if that's the case, how the culprit lock it from the outside? When Dad's group was attacked, their master key was definitely stolen. But the doors and windows of the guest house were built so you couldn't lock them from outside no matter how hard you tried. So the master key should have nothing to do with the guest house closed room. Jessica and Aunt Ava were turning their sadness at losing their blood relatives into anger at a person in front of them. Dr. Nanja was trying to step between them. And I sat in the sofa staring up at the ceiling, thinking about things that didn't even matter anymore with a worn out expression. I just couldn't believe this was the same parlor that had been so warm and pleasant midday yesterday, just for a short time before the typhoon hit. The sudden sound of a gunshot shook me out of my half-asleep trance. Smoke was rising out of the barrel of Aunt the gun Aunt Ava held. Jessica had fallen to the floor and was covering both of her eyes. Aunt Ava and Dr. Nanja were both looking down at her in shock. Are you okay, Jessica? Jessica! Ah! Ah! It hurts! It hurts! It hurts! Ah! Ah! It, it wasn't my fault! This happened because you came at me, even after I told you to stop! Hey, wait a second, what's going on? So did Jessica grab it on Ava, which turned into a scuffle? Did they start fighting over Aunt Ava's gun? Did some kind of impact cause the trigger to be pulled? I didn't know if the bullet had grazed her or if she'd been burned by the discharge. But either way, Jessica was covering both her eyes, screaming it hurts, it hurts, and rolling around on the floor. D don't worry, calm down. It is not a serious wound, so get a hold of yourself. My eyes hurt! It hurts! I can't see! I can't see! Dr. Nanja let Jessica borrow his shoulder, saying that he would let tender her in the servant room. The servant room this mansion had a bed and a first aid kit and was able to function as an infirmary. Damn it! You killed Mom and Dad! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! It wasn't me. It wasn't me! Jessica, you'll aggregate the moon, so don't move about. Come, let's go to the servant room. Jessica continued to curse Aunt Ava as her parents' murderer. It seemed that Aunt Ava couldn't conceal her trembling at the fact that she pulled the trigger, even if it had been an accident. It wasn't my fault. It happened because that kid jumped at me. I didn't kill anyone. More importantly, who killed George? That's right. Who killed George? George! George! It isn't my fault! It isn't my fault! Wait a sec! Aunt Ava! Don't go off on your own! I didn't know if it was because Aunt Ava couldn't bear her mistake, or if she'd given up the control of her body to anger at the person who had killed her only son, or if it was both of all of those mixed together. At any rate, she ran into the corridor yelling fearful and screaming. 
I was also worried about Jessica's condition, but right then, I couldn't leave Aunt Ava alone. Why would she go off on her own in this mansion of all places? Is she trying to get herself killed? Dr. Nanja took Jessica toward the servant room. I chased after Aunt Ava, dashing into the depths of the mansion. After sitting Jessica on the servant room bed, Nanja told her several times not to touch her eyes and examine the affected area. The barrel had probably been near her eyes. There was a possibility the flames from the discharge had injured her corneas. There was no threat to her life. It would probably be necessary to take her to a doctor as soon as possible. Nanja applied emergency first aid, covering the affected area with gauze, wrapping it with a bandage. As a result, Jessica completely lost her field of vision. Is that okay? The wound may hurt her itch, but you mustn't scratch at it or rub it. When tomorrow comes, let's go to an ophthalmologist as soon as possible. That bitch! She was really trying to kill me! If the angle had been just a little off, I'd been killed by now! I'll definitely turn her into the police! Ava would not do such a thing. That was an accident. You call that an accident? She killed Dad and Mom! There's no way any 19 person or witch exists on this island! She's behind everything! She was the only one on the first floor of the guest house! George must have seen her kill Mom and Dad, and she killed him to keep him quiet! It's the same with Grandfather and the servants! I'm sure she snuck out of the family conference last night and killed all of them! If that's the case indeed, we'll find out as soon as the police investigate. The police are incredible with their powers of discernment. There's nothing that can't be understood. There's no need for us to suspect or hate anyone. The police will resolve everything. So for now, Jessica, you should devote yourself to resting your body and keeping your eyes safe. Of course, if you wrinkle your forehead too much, it will do no good for your eyes, not to mention your beauty. When Jessica's abuse of Aunt Ava had reached a crescendo, she actually started glaring instinctively. The pressure on her eyes had hurt her. Jessica herself realized that the more she talked, the more the wound would hurt. And regardless of whether she overcome her suspicions of Ava, she regained her composure for the time being. She killed them. Dad and Mom. And Shannon. And Cannon. Cannon. She heard that Cannon had been killed in the chapel. Jessica still hadn't seen his face after he had died. Jessica was now less fearful about the fact that she was blinded, and more frightened that the police would carry Cannon's body away while she still couldn't see, and that she would have to say her final farewell without being able to look at his face. Her anger at the culprit, and her sadness at the death of the person she liked, those mixed emotions started her crying. But right now, tears were actually painful for her so she wasn't even permitted to leisurely remember his face in bygone days. Jessica could do nothing but sit on the bed and let her body droop, withstanding the pain. Well then, I am now more worried about Ava. I hope she isn't too shaken by this. Realizing Jessica had calmed down for the time being, let out a sigh. He stuck out his head into the hallway to look for any signs of others coming back. <gasps> then their eyes met. Nanjo, being unable to understand who this person was, was bewildered for an instant. I hear that people who have lost the power of sight have zero anti-magic power and magic resistance power. In other words, you're an isolated pawn right now. Understand what that means. W what did you just say? Nanjo had no way of understanding who the person in front of him was, much less what she had just said. Dr. Nanjo, what's going on? Unable to see, Jessica had to rely on voices alone to make out the situation. But since she had heard Nanjo say something in an uneasy tone, she tightened up, thinking something bad might have happened. 
S stop, please! Please don't kill me! I have a sick grandchild! I mustn't die here! Please spare me! <laughs> Dr. Nanjo? Dr. Nanjo! Jessica couldn't do anything except call out from the bed. Judging by the tone of his voice, Nanjo was in the corridor confronting someone, and he was scared. His life must have been threatened just a second ago. No! Stop it! <laughs> On the night, Twilight the Witch shall revive, and none shall be left alive. <laughs> the witch pointed the end of her gold staff at Nanjo. Even though he didn't know what she was planning to do, Nanjo assumed she must be trying to take his life. Dr. Nanjo! Dr. Nanjo! Is someone there? Answer me! S Stop it! <laughs> A sharp sound echoed. And just as sharply, the tip of the golden staff tapered and stretched, slicing into Nanjo's forehead. Jessica, who could only try to grasp what was happening with her ears, had no clue what was going on, but even so, she was able to realize with that sound, Nanjo had died. And she could tell that the person was now in the corridor, right in front of the servant room. Furthermore, since she couldn't see, she wouldn't be able to run away, much less resist. Knowing that she was a mouse in a trap, and in a life-or-death situation, Jessica shuddered. Oh, Jessica... Too bad your eyes got injured. Now you can't even escape. <laughs> I'm going to play a whole lot with Nanjo's corpse now. When I get bored of that, I'll kill you next and play a bunch more. No, wait. If I got you blind here already, I won't wait until you're dead. I'll have a lot of fun with you before I kill you too. <laughs> So shake there waiting for a while, okay? As you try to imagine all the ways I'm playing with Nanjo's corpse. <laughs> Jessica was struck with fear and let out a feral scream. She wanted to scream in a much louder voice trying to get someone to help her, but she couldn't. When faced with true fear, it clogs up a person's throat. Right then, Jessica could barely even breathe. Help me! Help me! <laughs> She searched around with her hands, trying to find some way to escape. But even though she should have known this room well, just being unable to see made it like a closed room of darkness. She ran to a shelf or something, and things like candy jars and balls fell down, hitting her on the head. As she was now, it'd be tougher to even guard her head to block it. She was painfully aware of how powerless humans become just by losing their sense of sight. Of course, she had no time to be impressed by this fact. She crawled around random trying to escape from that place. She kept bumping into things that she didn't understand, getting hit by various falling objects. It felt like the entire room was alive, bullying her and refusing to let her escape. Then the footstep could be heard from the presence in the hallway, and then a voice. She probably poked her head into the room since Jessica had been so loud. You really are noisy. Act like a lady and wait there on the bed. Cause I'll give you a wonderful blood red death outfit fitting for such an honored daughter. Something good enough to make the person who finds you faint, okay? <laughs> Until just a second ago, she had sworn that she'd kill the culprit if she found them. However, she was now very powerless. She couldn't do anything except let out a scream crawling around the floor, bumping her head into the bed and the legs of the desk. Help me! Help me! Someone help me! Dad! Mom! Battler! Someone come! Help me! Cannon! Uh-oh. In the corridor, as the witch thought about how to toy with Nanjo's life, a single gold butterfly secretly watched the scene from the corner of the hallway. It was Beto, who had barely escaped with her life once before. The gold butterfly softly returned to human form. It was faint and transparent like a lace curtain. By now, her power was so weak that maintaining even this form was difficult for her. Right next to her, Renove also appeared. 
It is unlikely that Jessica will survive. Of course, there would be no survivors from the very beginning. She has grown feelings of love for Canon. I have toyed with them at times. However, such behavior was shameful for a witch. Love is a single element. Romantic love is even more pure and even more sacred. But for some reason, you seem to despise it thoroughly, milady. Teacher told me, magic exists to bring people happiness. That's something I myself must have been aware of in the past. Ever since I forgot that, I stopped being a witch. And so I lost the right to be Balor's opponent. I can hardly believe it, milady. Do you actually intend to rescue Jessica? It will be dangerous. I know. Even if I do save her, she will become a plaything of the witch's banquet when the door to the golden land opens. But even so, that death would be far more compassionate than what that person would do to her. The witch's banquet steals lives in a terrible way, but it does not do more than once. It does not toy with life and death. However, that person is different. She kills over and over. She kills for fun. There's not even a trace of compassion there. I want to at least save Jessica from that kind of cruel fate. Certainly, by carrying that out, you probably would be praised as a good witch. However, the new Beatrice already views you as hostile, milady. If you were to be seen by her again, you would not have any method of escape this time, correct? When I reunited George and Shannon, I finally understood what a witch is, and what magic is. I am a witch. I must act as a witch. And I must be acknowledged as Balor's opponent and make Balor accept me as a witch this time around. The road to that goal may be long and difficult. However, if I do not take a step forward here and now, I won't be able to call myself a witch. I understand your feelings, but how do you plan to rescue her? There are not many forms of magic that your body is capable of now, milady. Did you not have to borrow George's power even back when you revived Shannon? Indeed. And for that very reason, I may be able to save Jessica. Right now, she's begging for Canon to save her. If I can borrow that power of that emotion, my magic may be able to knock the door of the Land of the Dead once again. You may be able to knock, however... You would use up all of your magical energy. If you were to be spied by the new Beatrice, you would surely be without a method of escape. I am no longer your butler, milady. I understand that I cannot assist you if the situation worsens. I know. By now I have toyed with and taken more lives than I can count, so I may not even be able to make up for it, except by saving the same number of lives bringing them through that door. I have nothing to lose in the first place. I'm just a gold butterfly who has passed its name and magic power on, and who is no longer acknowledged as a witch. What about Battler? You are partway through a game with him. He has said that he would wait until you returned. Are you truly satisfied to end it here? You have a duty to return to the seat across from Battler, milady. For that very reason, if there is a life that only I can save, I will save it. And I will be accepted as a witch. I must become a witch. If this is training, it is a very childish thing. Nothing that compares with the evils I have committed before now. Vanish, Renove. Watch may be what may be the final... Oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. Okay. Vanish, Renove. Watch what may be the final magic of a single butterfly who used to be called a witch. Certainly. Please show me magic. I will not disgrace the name of the Golden Witch. And I pray that it is not your final spell. Go, my friend. If you can find enough ink, write down the story of my foolish life, and hand it over to some fool who is about to walk down the same path. So long, Renove.
unknown. Where are you? Where are you? Help me! Help me! <laughs> Milady, I am always there by your side. C Canon? Canon! It seemed to Jessica as though she had heard Canon's voice just then. She looked around with unseeing eyes, but of course she saw nothing. On the contrary, that action caused her head to hit the desk again. Canon! Canon, help me! Help me! Yes, milady. I will help you. Canon! You survived! This time she thought she heard his voice clearly. Jessica jumped up in surprise, banging her head against the desk once again. Milady, please calm your heart and listen. Unfortunately, I am not alive. Huh? I have already died. However, that witch came to me to tell me of your peril. And she gave me just a little bit of time so I could save you, milady. Please calm your heart even more. If you do, my form will become even visible to you, milady. Jessica obeyed those words. She chased all the idle thoughts from her head and relaxed her breathing. Of course, her heart felt like it was going to explode after hearing the voice of the one she liked and thought was dead. She resisted the excitement with all of her strength. When she did, she felt as though Canon really was right in front of her. Even though she shouldn't have been able to see her with her eyes, she was able to sense him clearly. Can you see me, milady? Yeah, I can see. I can definitely see you, Canon. I exist only as a soul now, so I cannot touch you, milady. I cannot do anything except talk to you like this. With my current weak existence, I can do nothing more than that. But I should be able to be of some aid to you, milady. So, we can only talk? I can't touch you, Canon? I'm now more fragile than smoke from a candle. So much so that one that living such as you were to touch me, I would be wiped away instantly. So please don't try to touch me, because I am also... Holding back my desire to touch you, milady. Uh, uh, okay. More importantly, milady, please listen well. The new golden witch has a cruel heart. She surely plans to make you meet with a horrible fate. You must escape from this room and hide. How? I can't see anything. Quiet. I'll be your eyes, milady. Please move in accordance with my instructions. Verse. Please crawl three steps from there, then stand up. You're now under the desk, milady. If you stand there, you'll hit your head. Th that was under the desk? Okay. One, two, three. I'm gonna stand. Well done. Next, please turn to face toward nine o'clock. Yes, well done. <laughs> This is pretty embarrassing. Uh, ah, ow. Are you okay? Did your wound hurt? N no, I'm fine. What next? Jessica thought that if this was a dream, she didn't want to wake up. If she were allowed to, she would want to take off the bandage covering her eyes and see him. However, if she did that, Cano might vanish like a frail candle smoke, just like he himself had said. She was afraid of that. So she satisfied with herself with just listening to his words once more, repressing her desire to see him, to hold him. Therefore, what her, her eyes now were tears of gratitude. Tears of gratitude for the god, or maybe the witch, who had given her this miraculous moment. Is this okay? If we keep talking like this, won't we be noticed by her? Won't our voices be heard? I have erected a secrecy barrier. As long as we don't make any loud sounds or speak noisily, no one will notice us. That's why people can't tell when I'm around. I, I don't really get it, but anyway, we'll be fine as long as we stay quiet, right? W what should I do next? Please walk ten steps in that direction. You will touch the sofa. Please continue along that. Do it slowly. Stay calm. Believe in my words. Sh sure! <laughs> it's weird. 
Even though it's so scary not being able to see... I'm not scared at all if you're with me, Canon. Yes. That is the sofa. Trace it to the left while advancing slowly. There's a table just to your left. Be careful not to bump into it with your shins. It was a very, very strange and bizarre team effort. Even though she would have been killed in an instant if the terrible witch noticed her. There was no fear in Jessica's heart. She was being protected and guided by Canon. Someone she thought she'd never be reunited with. It would probably just be a momentary miracle. Even so, Jessica was deeply grateful for it. If she had hoped too much, she was sure he would disappear, so she'd try not to ruin this faint miracle. Trying to engrave this moment into her heart for all eternity, she slowly, slowly continued to walk, obeying Canon's voice. Okay, if you walk ten more steps, you will exit the servant room. Then please turn to face nine o'clock and keep walking very slowly. Put your hand on the wall to the right and keep on following that. I will take you to a safe room. If I go there, will you leave, Canon? Canon didn't answer, but his lack of an answer was enough to tell her the truth. Then, no way. I don't want to go. If you stay here, you'll be killed by the witch. I don't mind. If I'm killed, I can go to the world where you are, Canon. Milady, please listen to me. The human world is too bright and painful for the dead like me, so I cannot stay for long. So, Milady, please allow me to use what time I am allowed to guide you to a safe place, because after that, I'll stay with you until my time runs out. Is that the very best you can manage, Canon? Yes. In exchange, I will stay by your side as long as possible. I'll stay with you and talk with you, milady. Talk about what? What do you want to talk about? I don't care what, as long as you're willing to tell me, Canon. Well then, I will tell you the story of a cowardly servant boy who lacked all courage. The story of a foolish and pitiful boy who fell in love with a young lady as radiant as the sun, even when the lady confessed those same feelings to him. He lost his cowardice and was never able to be honest with his feelings while he still lived. Yes. Then I, I want to tell you a story, too. It's the story of a cowardly girl who couldn't muster the courage to tell the boy she loved how much she felt much, much more often. The story of how that girl... After being reunited with that boy by a miracle from God, used that chance to finally muster up her courage. I also want to hear that. So, for that reason as well, let's go to a safe place. Yeah, if I could be with you, Canon, I would walk however far, however long it took. I don't need eyes anymore. If you tell me to step forward, I will take that step, even if it leads off a cliff. Thank you. Come, milady. Let us go. The first ten steps. No, I don't like it. I won't do it. Unless you call me Jessica. Understood. Well then, Jessica. Take the first ten steps. Yes, Canon. Give me a moment. Okay. Very quietly, Jessica and Canon slowly snuck out of the servant room. Just around the corner, the witch could be cruelly s My bad. Just around the corner, the witch could be seen cruelly looking down at Nanja's corpse, but she didn't even notice their presence. However, Renove, who stood at the ready by her side, met Canon's eyes. Canon thought, oh no, grimacing and blocking Jessica with his back. However, Renove did not inform his master. He played dumb, just as though he hadn't spotted Kano in the first place. No, maybe he did appear to chuckle. From a finger in Renove's hands, which were joined behind his back, a small gold butterfly appeared, flying in front of Kano as though guiding him. It went unnoticed by the master he served. Kano was surprised at the magic the butterfly held. 
It was far more powerful than the secrecy barrier that Canon possessed. He may not have known it, but the power of his had originally been in Renove's. Canon's ability was an imitation of that which Kinzo had made and given to him. As a butterfly of secrecy magic scattered gold scales, it grew smaller bit by bit. It probably wouldn't last long, but without a doubt, even that would buy them enough time to get far away from the cruel witch. Okay, milady. Let's follow that wall and keep walking. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, if I can be with you, Canon, I'll keep going and going on and on. Led and protected by the small gold butterfly, the pair separated by the wall of life and death slowly walked away toward the end of the corridor. There was no way the evil witch could have had magic to notice their flight. Until they disappeared at the other end of the corridor, the witch didn't realize that Jessica had vanished. Okay, give me a bit. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry. I had to deal with the cricket. It's really irritating. Even though it would have been a quick trip if she had been able to see it as now. It had been a very long adventure. Come, milady. We reach the parlor. I will now take you to the bundle of curtains by the window. If you hide in there, you'll surely be safe. Inside the curtains? Not bad. I used to hide there a lot, a long ago. Beatrice. Huh? Can't call out the witch's name. Jessica looked around in surprise, but she obviously couldn't spot the witch when she couldn't see. Beato had appeared once again with a faint form. Can't squared off against the figure of the evil witch, but Beato's expression was soft or even pitying. I don't know what sort of whim led you to revive me, nor do I understand what you're thinking now. Oh, it was nothing more than a whim. No. This is how witches should be. It took me a thousand years to realize that. That is how foolish it is. H who is it? Who's there? Milady, be quiet. She is the witch Beatrice. I owe her because she let me be with you one more time. The witch Beatrice? Forget about me. More importantly, you should quickly hide that girl in the shadows of the curtains. You probably do not have much time left. You may spend it having a final conversation with Jessica. A secret meeting inside a bunch of curtains. How clever you two are. <laughs> uh, um, thank you, Beatrice. Thank you for letting me be with Canon. Jessica didn't know where Beata was, so she said that while facing in the wrong direction. Perhaps because she found that funny, Beato snickered. I will now leave this room to the pair of lovers. Evil witches have no need for tales of love. Allow me to depart. Beatrice, thank you very much. <laughs> there is no need to thank me. You know that something like this cannot compensate for all the evil I have done before. I offer my gratitude to this good witch as a parting gift. I don't know what has happened before or what will happen later. However, at this very moment, you are without a doubt a good witch. You flatter me, Furniture. The next time we meet, I may be an evil witch who doesn't betray your expectations. And with that, farewell. Beto left the parlor and closed the door. And mustering the last of her remaining magical power, she sealed the door. The fact that those two had escaped into here would eventually be noticed. And now that the night twilight had been reached, no matter how much they struggled, their inescapable fate had already been decided. However, until the final moment, they should be given the chance to speak with each other of their love. 
The witch poured out all of her magical power to protect their time together. So that no one would be able to defile their time alone until the last possible moment. At that time, Beato noticed something. Her body had been detected by a magical searching technique. The evil witch's furniture had sniffed this place 